June 21st and 22nd, 1922, one of the deadliest labor disputes in the country occurred right here in Southern Illinois, the Heron Massacre. Using testimony from those who were there in 1922 and talking with local historians, we can piece together what actually happened 100 years ago. The story begins in April of 1922. The United Mine Workers of America go on a national strike, demanding higher wages and less hours per work week. And that included mines in southern Illinois. This was you know, one of the best places to be a blue collar employee anywhere in the country uh, because the wages were fairly good. You had economic freedoms. You owned your own house. Unions had fought for years to achieve those things. And any move to break up the union by using non-union miners, known by many at the time as scabs, would be met with hostility. Well, it was a matter of life and death or a matter of survival back in 1922 to the old miners around here and here. You let one scab move in, it's just like a cancer. It just keeps spreading. And that's why they was fighting out here at Leicester Strip. They was trying to nip it in a bud, you might say. Just northwest of Marion, the Southern Illinois Coal Company, owned by William J. Lester, has a new strip mine and a massive steam shovel ready to uncover ground to reach the coal below. And the deal was, let us at least keep your people working, taking off the dirt. Because we got, we got 20, 40 feet of dirt, whatever it was, until we got to the seam of coal. But by mid-June, the dirt has been removed. The union miners refuse to go any further. We'll not start digging out coal until the strike is over. But Lester is in debt, needing money now. So the company said, you're fired. We'll bring in replacement workers. Uh, and when you bring in replacement workers, we'll bring in guards. Guards from the Hargrave Detective Agency out of Chicago, heavily armed to protect the mine, fearing the union's violence. It's like if they would have just waited, I mean, the company waited a week, but he wanted to get to market first. And that precipitated everything that happened. The violence began on Tuesday, June 21st, 1922, miles away from the mine. There was an ambush on Route 13 in what's now Crab Orchard Lake, um, where the union ambushed a truck carrying a bunch of replacement workers or guards coming in from the Illinois Central Railroad Depot in uh, Carbondale. One Hargrave guard is shot and would die months later. But the violence does not stop as the Union miners head to the Lester Strip Mine. The Lester Strip Mine is an above ground mine. It's surrounded by dirt berms, so it's like a fort. The Union attacks the mine on the afternoon of June the 21st. Uh, but they get more than they give. The, there's about 20 Hargrave agents armed to the teeth and they're hidden behind this dirt berm and they shoot and kill three Union coal miners. Back and forth shooting continues overnight and could even be heard by residents living in nearby Marion. By morning, the mine superintendent, C.K. McDowell, a man known for breaking a strike in Kansas, is ready to surrender. McDowell thought that they would be, he told the men, oh, you'll be abused, cussed, and kicked some. They'll take us to the Heron train station, which they had promised, and we'll go home. And I think McDowell actually believed that. Why would you surrender if you thought otherwise? Guards and replacement workers surrender to the union and they're marched out of the mine, Superintendent McDowell leading the way. Uh, Otis Clark pulls him over to the side, shoots him twice in the chest and leaves him for dead. About a mile up the road as they're marching towards Heron, Hugh Willis blocks the highway with his automobile and tells probably a crowd of 200 uh, Union coal miners, you can't kill these men on the highway, there are women and children. So behind the power plant with some woods and about 100 feet inside, the tree line was a barbed wire fence. And they lined everybody up against the barbed wire fence uh, and they counted down and started shooting. Many of the men die along the fence. And so them people get killed, it's like killing dogs. I was right there close as four, five, six feet from them. Others ran, just simply weren't hit or they were hit, wounded, and they escaped in the woods. A lot of people just died there. Subsequently, we know of at least one that died in a field off the of Clark Trail, uh, just probably from his wounds he'd received earlier. Uh, one was hung in Harrison Woods, um, about a few blocks south of Clark Trail. Um, six were captured. 
it's about 9.30 in the morning. They decide to tie ropes around their necks, six guys, and march them to the Heron Cemetery and tell them they're going to kill them. The crowd marches the six men down what is now Stotler Road toward the cemetery. When they get to the front entrance, all six men are shot and their throats cut. And the men that were here, the, 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 the so-called strike breaker, most of them were shot, either shot or dead, laying out here dead right in this area. The one guy that I remember so well, a, a, lady, a lady carrying this child, and she was questioning him, told him he had no business out here to begin with. <clears throat> and uh, she finally said, where are you shot? And he pointed crosswise across the stomach made a gesture. I don't believe he could talk. A lot of them were begging for water, and I didn't see anybody give them any water. They were begging, begging for water, but nobody offered them any. They just let them lay there and die. In total, at least 22 people received wounds that would result in death on June 21st and 22nd. Some that witnessed the horrific events unfold immediately felt remorse. Others saw it as something that just had to be done. If it, had, if it hadn't been for what happened back in the 20s, which uh, some of my folks, Ken folks, were involved in it, uh, I don't think you'd have any union around here at this time. Coal miners or any other kind of a union. That's what makes your union is believing in it and willing to fight for it. It's just like fighting for your country. In July 1922, dozens were indicted for murder or conspiracy to commit murder but two different trials would be marred by intimidation to witnesses and rumors of bribes. No one is ever convicted of any of the indictments. Survivors testified, this is the man that shot me, this is the man that beat me, this is the man that, you know, survivors. They had a second trial, uh, spring of 23, same deal, no conviction, jury disconnect. Today, there are very few signs of the violence. In the Heron Cemetery, the three UMWA miners killed in the Heron Massacre have big granite headstones donated by the Union back in 1922. As for the Union miners, their graves were forgotten until 2013 when a research team was able to locate those graves in the cemetery. Then in 2015, the city of Heron, through donations, put up a marker where the victims of the Heron Massacre lay, finally coming to peace with the tragic event. Marking the 100th anniversary today, local historian John Musgrave, who you saw featured in this story, will give a presentation on the Heron Massacre at the Heron City Library this afternoon at 1 p.m. There will also be a special ceremony at the Heron City Cemetery this afternoon at 3 p.m. remembering the victims of the massacre.